and we'll get going. Hi everyone, thanks for thanks for joining the uh, feeder alignment committee meeting this evening. Um, I'm Ron Lesko, the director of communications and operations, and doing a quick introduction uh, for Superintendent Adams, who participated in legislative testimony this afternoon that ran uh, into the evening. She will be joining us. She'll just be a few minutes late. So um, I just want to say hello to everyone, get us started, and I'm going to turn it over to Board President Ann Savage to take us uh, through the meeting. Thank you very much, and I understand the superintendent made very persuasive testimony today, so we appreciate the work that she did and that you do um, in preparing her for that, Ron, so thank you very much for all that work. Um, so unfortunately, we do not have scenarios to provide you with tonight. Um, the last bit of the data came in today, uh, a little bit after in the middle of the afternoon, so that was not enough time to pull things together completely. But we thought it would still be useful to meet so we could catch you up on what we've done since we last met and um, we can clarify some questions and maybe anticipate some things that might happen when we get to scenarios. So you should have a brief agenda um, and I am going to try and follow that. You should also have received in your email an Excel document that I can share as well. Hang on, I will share the document. Um, Hopefully everybody can see. I can also make it bigger when the time comes. Um, but we wanted to catch you up on what, what we've been doing and the changes that have been made since then. And I'll just start, and then I know Dr. Robin will have things to add. So the first thing that's new and different since we last saw you is that we were able to untangle the mystery of the, the dual data and pull it out so that the DCS column is truly DCS less dual. And there is a true dual column with all the same data that every other uh, school has. So that was a good improvement because we know that especially as dual doubles in size, it looks quite different than DCS and we want to be able to reflect that properly as we try to construct equitable um, middle schools. So I know nobody's had a chance to really look at this and ask any questions about it or, th or formulate questions about it. And I don't expect people to do that on the fly. So um, if if the data, I know Dorian, you know this data really well, and if it's something does stand out to you, we can certainly double check it. But I, I think Dr. Robin feels pretty confident that this is reflective of the real split between, between dual and DCS. So that's the first thing, um, and you'll see that here in the spreadsheet. How, how's the size of this spreadsheet for people? Is it, can you actually read the numbers and things? Yes, all right, okay. So then the next thing that we had talked about as a group is retention. And this was something that we were wondering about, like how many fifth graders really roll forward to sixth grade and, and what would that mean? What does that mean in terms of us uh, projecting uh, balanced enrollment? And so Dr. Robin was able to pull that data. And uh, that's what's in front of you on the screen right now. Both of us, I think, were, um, as we thought through it, every time we talked about it, it became more and more complicated um, and less and less easy to pinpoint the implications. So what you're looking at here is, and I can make it a little bigger, this is fifth to sixth grade retention data. All right, so the number of fifth graders in one year, number six, those same exact sixth graders the next year. And what happened? So and that's divided by school, okay? And these are the numbers of the just a simple percentage, right? Okay, that's all that is. The color coding happens by year, so red is the least that year, green is the most that year. So we started looking at this and then we took an average and we were starting to use this on a school by school basis. And then we started to put some more thought into what this data really represents. And here's two factors that came to our mind immediately and I'm very open to further conversation about this. These schools, you will notice that these schools, uh, Toast, Ash, Giffen and Eagle Point from 2018 to 2019, that was not an elementary to middle school transition. Those students were still in elementary school in sixth grade that year. That was before we made the shift. Then they, this year, they were sort of 
shifted, right? You guys may all remember that we had sixth graders in middle school. I know Bill would remember this, but they were still beds coded with their elementary school. So they sort of were middle schoolers, but sort of weren't. And they were only really middle schoolers this year for the first time, which is this 2021 to 21, 22. So you could arguably say, OK, well, let's at least take the last two years of data and use that because that'll be representative, right? Except what do we know about the last two years? Those are hugely impacted by COVID, right? So we really have no information whatsoever for our elementary schools that used to go to sixth grade about how they would retain in a non COVID environment. There's zero. There's no data. There is no experience that we've ever had as a district in which that happened. The other thing that we noticed about this data is that this year and this year for certain schools, so that's the two COVID years, look quite different than the first year, right? In particular, the only couple of times that we ever had any school retain less than 70% of their fifth graders as they went to sixth grade was over the last couple of years. Presumably that's a COVID impact. We don't know, but it seems likely that that's a COVID impact. So as we thought about that, um, and Dr. Robin was really helpful in like identifying these challenges, there's a real lack of confidence that these school by school percentages, like if you just took these averages, that they're representative of, of anything real um, because of the significant impacts of COVID. So what we have done for now, and we're open to redoing this with further conversation from all of you, but what we've done for now is we've looked at this number, the one in the box, which was the last non COVID year school district wide, fifth grade to sixth grade. And we assumed that that we built that into the model. I'm not going to say we assumed anything. We built that into the model. Interestingly, we also tried taking the sixth to seventh grade. Like I was like, that was one of the brainstorms that Dr. Robin has. Like, well, wait, what if we took the sixth to seventh grade enrollment for our four? troublemakers. They're not really troublemakers. You know what I mean? The sixth graders, right? Amazingly, it's almost the same damn number, right? District wide. It's very different because Eagle Point looks really different than the others. But when you add them all up, you still get to just shy of 82%. OK, so that I think gave us some confidence that around 82% is not an unreasonable expectation for how many people are going to make the elementary to middle school jump. So I guess I'm gonna stop talking for a minute and just ask if anybody has any questions or reflections on that, whether you feel like that's a, a process, a methodology that, that feels right in that context or anything else you wanna share on that. Um, I, I guess I, I think that, that makes sense for that use and projecting overall enrollment. And I guess I'm just curious whether you think that you might be able to say like COVID is a situation that parents didn't like and that you could say New Scotland, Eagle Point and DCS showed that parents would in those schools react most strongly to an event they don't like. And so in that way, like you wouldn't want to change the enrollment or I, I, I don't know what, but like, can you draw any conclusions from those data points and, and draw, you know, non enrollment? Exactly. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if you can make that. Uh, I really don't know how unique COVID would be in terms of the way that implicated. I personally found it extremely interesting that Montessori looked really different than New Scotland and Eagle Point. Like I just was really surprised. I expected to see sort of like the racial, racial and socioeconomic impact kind of to see some consistency. And uh, you don't see that at all. Um, so the other piece of information that I didn't mention, but that's also impactful is charter schools, right? When, a, when there's a year where charters increase their middle school enrollment um, and we've had 
increasing grades and Ron knows this so much better than I do. I always have to check. Um, we've had some increases in grades in charter schools, which has some impact, particularly in like the Spasa Giffen um, community. Um, so there's so many factors that go into that retention. It just felt wrong to try and do it school by school. Right. No matter what you did, it just felt like that was asking. I think Dr. Robin's words were trying to find um, a, a certain level of accuracy that just really isn't there um, from from what we know in the data. Yeah, I think and I can just add that in the last, you know, just from a programming and, and you know, a, a staffing perspective, that 82 percent ish number sounds about right. And if you remember from our last meeting, I raised the concern, not a concern, but I raised the issue around um, the for number of students um, joining our middle schools from fifth to sixth grade. So this does feel about right, um, just pay, based on past experience. Oh, that's excellent. That's good. So yeah, I think based on uh, New Scotland Elementary's data, I, I would say, you know, knowing that school a little better, uh, it is COVID impact uh, because when we went virtual, when we didn't have enough Chromebooks and stuff, I know a lot of parents shifted their kids to parochial schools, which were not virtual and didn't need Chromebooks. Uh, so that that for that is definitely a, uh, something that and you can see New Scotland is turning back now, now that we're in person. Uh, and I, and I, I'm guessing that Eagle Point uh, probably is reacting a little later, but is on that same trend. Well, and yeah, Eagle Point also, it's they're now six to seven. They're now in middle school for sixth grade, which um, they weren't prior. So that's different than New Scotland in that sense. Um, <laughs> go ahead. Just on New Scotland, does this drop, the drop from 91 to 62, is that reflecting just that, didn't New Scotland like shrink? Like it went from four classes to three? No, this is truly 1920 fifth <laughs> graders. 2021 20, sixth graders, these are the same human beings, right? These are the 91 kids that were in fifth grade. Oh, oh, oh. And the next year, when you look for them, because we have an ID, right, a, a number that represents each student, when you look for them in sixth grade, only 62 of them were there. Okay. This yeah, year, when, when, when those kids would be going to, so New Scotland, for example, would the current pattern would be going to Hackett. And again, if people didn't want their kids going to Hackett, and took them out and put them in a different middle school, uh, parochial or, or uh, charter. charter or what have you. That's what you would see there. And it's about a, overall for the district. It's like what 130 students distributed. Uh, it varies year to year. Um, I actually have that and I, if it's OK with folks, I'd like to shift now to the next question, which is that new entrance piece, because we all know our 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 sixth grade is not 82 percent smaller or 18% smaller than our fifth grade. So where are these new kids coming from becomes the question, right? So Dr. Robin did that for us also, and that is new enrollees. So looking at those same years, there were 100 and technically 110, 78 and 67 new enrollees at sixth grade. That was much larger than I understood. Lori probably is going to say, yeah, of course, operationally, we know that's what it's really like. But for me, from the outside, I did not realize it would be such a large number. That's a very, very big number. So then the question is, if we have all these new enrollees, how do we make sure that they're not skewing our carefully crafted projections for uh, balanced middle schools, right? And so we talked about that for quite a while, Superintendent and uh, Dr. Robin and I do, did. And Laura, you were not there, but I'm very interested in your opinion. Um, here's what we did. We took these kids, these actual human beings, and we looked up their home address. Then we matched their home address to their neighborhood elementary catchment area, because we know that operationally, when you walk in the door at sixth grade, under most circumstances, you're supposedly going to the neighborhood catchment area for your the middle school associated with your neighborhood catchment area. And then we distributed those kids through that. That's why there's zeros in the in the magnet columns. And there's only numbers in the up in the neighborhood schools. OK, and we added them up and then we took an average um, and we looked at what percent of new entrants 
would be coming from each of those catchment areas. And our intention then is to treat them as if for purposes of balancing, right? As if they were enhanced enrollment in those neighborhood schools, right? So we are saying on average over the last three years, we had 84 new entrants. Of those 84, we would anticipate that 11%, in other words, 10 students come from the New Scotland catchment area. So we're gonna bump the New Scotland um, enrollment by that number and assume that those 10 kids are gonna behave like a New Scotland kid. I don't know that it's a great model, but it's better than anything else that we could come up with. So again, interested in people's reactions to that. Lori, operationally, if that's totally out of whack, please do share. Yeah, no, I mean, we do get an influx at the beginning of, of the school year and over the summer, we get a lot of um, students with disabilities transferring from, from one district to another. And then we get another influx in January after um, the um, holiday break. My wondering for 1920 school year is because there's a big difference between the 1920, 2021 and then 21, 22. I'm wondering how many of those students are uh, um, refugees or immigrants? If, if there's a way to, to take a look at that, because those would have been the kiddos that would have fed into AIC that year. Um, so that's just a wondering um, for me. And then same thing, even though the numbers are a little bit lower, um, where we're seeing an influx, you know, an increase in sixth grade enrollment, 78 and 67, Again, how many of those are our immigrants and our refugees? Just to kind of get a sense of um, where they may be coming from. Um, because now we have AIC, right? And I know right now that we have 90 kiddos, approximately, it's a little bit less than 90, but in grades six, seven, and eight at AIC. And that would be our maximum enrollment. Um, so that's reducing what we would actually see at the, at the middle level. So it's a wondering. So you're wondering if I'm going to formulate it um, in terms of um, is are the newcomers similar to their elementary catchment area peers? So is that a valid assumption for the model? Um, so is it reasonable to think that those 10 kids are going to look like um, New Scotland kids just because they live in the New Scotland area? Correct. OK, so we can take that for homework. The other piece that you mentioned that I just want to add on to and then I'm, I will yield the floor to somebody else is you mentioned AIC and I realized I didn't put that on the agenda, even though it was something that we had talked about among the smaller group. There are some 50 some odd elementary AIC students right now in grades three, four and five. So how do we account for them in this model, right? And so the superintendent and I talked about that and also I think she texted with Cecily or you, Lori, somebody. Um, and the understanding for purposes of balancing, right? Individual kids may have individual things happen to them, but for purposes of projecting the balancing, that they are still beds coded with their neighborhood school. So that even if they're placed with AIC, all of the academic data, when it says uh, Delaware Community School, it includes the AIC students that are beds coded with the um, Delaware Community School. So it's correct sort of mathematically mm -hmm. to treat them as um, as if they went to that school. And so we're we're OK in terms of this, the, the way the model is structured. That's correct. Yep. Okay. So and so, a quick question. Yeah, go ahead. The survival data. So if you were to do the same treatment that you did with the uh, newcomer data, like do a two percentage and then get an average number. What is a ballpark to like for these schools? Would it be like 20 kids, 30 kids, something like that? And then if so, would they sort of neutralize if you were to combine both Wait, of those? I don't know that I understand you correctly. The, the answer is, the, oh, the answer is you'd have to add up the differences. Is that what you're saying? And see if they neutralize? Right. I, the my my answer then I'm interested in Dr. Robbins thinking, but my answer to that is I don't know. But even if they did, is that a good idea to just treat them as neutral because of the thing that Lori just recommend just noted? If the kids who leave New Scotland 
perform substantially better than the new entrants from the New Scotland um, catchment area, you're really creating some misleading. It, it works for enrollment balancing, but not for academic balancing. Yeah, let's let's get a better handle on who the the newcomers are and what they look like. We can start with immigration status and then maybe look at um, some of their performance metrics as well. I have a question. I apologize. You probably already said this. What rules govern when a, when a student joins the district in sixth grade? What rules govern what middle school that student goes to now and will that stay the same? It, uh, well, I can answer the first question. The answer okay. is it's based on their elementary catchment area. So we look at their home address okay. and wherever they live that determines. And in fact, you can see that if you just go to the district's registration page mm -hmm. and you look at that, you know, that long list of addresses, with there's that, a column the for yep. elementary and there's a column for middle and the middle aligns with the feeder pattern. Okay, so it's as if you went to your neighborhood elementary school, essentially. For purposes of enrollment, yes. The question, mm -hmm. the question that Lori is bringing up, which is really, I think, the question about how we balance the model is what's the implication in terms of performance, right? Do those kids look like the kids in their neighborhood school? And right. I don't think we know the answer to that at this point. Um, just a quick thought that it would, it would only make sense to do it this way because um, if I'm assuming that these additional students um, wouldn't have had time to enroll in like uh, the lottery system for uh, magnet schools, right? So, like, we could. Well, they're entering the district at sixth grade, so there's they 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 wouldn't have. They right. Were... There's, there's no point, right? They don't. That's not some. That's not a thing. Right. It's so... just not a thing because the middle schools, the ele the magnets all end at fifth grade. Uh, well, now all the magnets end at fifth grade, so they wouldn't. As they, these are kids who came to the district at sixth, sixth grade. grade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it would only make sense to divide them based on where they would go with their neighbor. Yeah. And that's always been our policy. And there's been individual cases where that's been something where parents have pushed back and asked for special consideration. You know, I, whatever, I live a half a mile from whatever. I don't know. I, there's always there's always things. Um, but as a general rule, that's the there is a formal policy that requires that, and that is the general rule. Um, all else being equal. Got it. And it seems like there's a there's a topic related to that for much farther down the line for this committee, which is, um, will we? How much wiggle room do we have for things like neighborhood preference, sibling preference, parent preference? Are there are we going to have rules about those things? But I think that's still way out of scope for where we're at at this process. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I can. And I, I so right now we do have a system in place. It's called open enrollment for our middle schools. Um, and you know when a fam a new family registers within our district currently. Um, if we don't have space in that middle school and some of our middle schools, the great some of the grade levels are closed because their 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 enrollment is so high in that grade level that we have to give them another option for one of our other middle schools. However, if a family is is really um, you know determined to get their child into their let's just say that they're in the Hackett catchment zone and for personal reasons, daycare childcare reasons, uh, work related reasons they would like to have their child go to, to Myers. There we have an open enrollment form currently that they can fill out um, to say I'm interested in sending my child to this this middle school um, and we would take that into consideration if we have won the program um, that their child needs because sometimes if it's a special needs student or an English language learner and we you know at North Albany we don't have the uh, ENL program so we would have to take all that into consideration and then if we did have the program, we would then take into consideration um, space and, and the number of students. So, I mean, I don't know whether that will change moving forward when we do this realignment work. Um, we have our new feeder pattern. Um, but that's a, you know, a conversation for a different day. OK, so that's a good takeaway for um, Dr. Robin to try and get a handle on these newcomers and whether they look the same. I will send back to you, Dr. Robin, because I have, but you don't yet, the student IDs associated with their neighborhood school, their neighborhood elementary catchment area. So that if you want to look at it at that fine grade in detail, you can. I'll send you that. OK, thanks. Um, OK, so that brings us to the um, uh, and oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> Uh, before we move on, I just wanted to ask one more question about um, our 
our expectations of newcomers um, for this year and the next as Albany, as, as we will have more probably refugee and immigrant students coming in as a resettlement city. Do we have that data and do we have a projection? I don't think we do. I mean, I could contact Jill, right? I could ask Jill Peckinpah if she has any kind of numbers, but I don't know uh, at USCRI. Um, I don't know. Do, does anybody on the other sh on the staff side know anything in terms I of know something? Tom, Tom Gillier throws around numbers on that. He, you know, does he know? No, I don't think anyone really knows what's going to happen. Jill Peckinpah be one step further upstream than Tom Gillio, but it's something he thinks, spends his days thinking about. So. Yeah, we, he, we he does. To, he's in constant contact with USCRI. Um, I don't have the updated numbers from him. Um, I can certainly get them and share them out with the superintendent, Ron and, and um, Ann, and to get those out to the committee. But off the top of my head, I know we had a, a pretty large influx of newcomers um, in December and then into the, the, I'm sorry, my cat is trying to walk across my computer. So when you see my <laughs> camera going off, that's why. Um, so, I, and then I, we had can, uh, an influx I, at the beginning of, of January as well, but it's 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 kind of slowed down. Um, we're still getting them on a daily basis, but not as uh, the numbers aren't as high, but I can get an update on, on a projection. Yeah, we, through October, we had 230 newcomers into our new uh, uh, refugee and immigrant students into our school district, which was 100 more than at that point last year. Uh, and then in November, we uh, we welcomed, uh, I think the number was around 40 or 50 of families from Afghanistan. And that the numbers that we've uh, we've received from USCRI, and I have this I have this from Tom. Uh, we've talked a lot about this as it relates to our legislative priorities for uh, for the upcoming year. Uh, is that as many as 600 uh, individuals, particularly from Afghanistan, because of the unrest that has happened there uh, in 2021. Are anticipated to be resettled in in the Albany area, and a majority of those a majority of those individuals are school aged children. So we're anticipating, based on the information that we've received from USCRI, that we are going to continue to see uh, a, a large influx of uh, newcomers I into our programs and into our community. And you know, and I think we can all watch uh, the geopolitical landscape as 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 things happen. And uh, Ukraine obviously is a very a very hot part of the of the world right now, and I would, you know, anytime you see those uh, those kinds of geopolitical happenings around the globe, um, uh, immigration to our country follows. And as a resettlement city, I think we we should always anticipate that, particularly under this presidential administration, that um, you know uh, that we are going to start to see those numbers grow again, like they did in, in during the Obama the Obama years. And obviously, we saw the numbers go the other way for our school district, and I think for the country during. Uh, during the Trump year, so uh, we have started to see an increase in in uh, in ENL students moving back into our community uh, in during the school year. And I think in in terms of the way the balancing, you know, our projections work, I think it's reasonable. Catch me if you catch me if you think I'm wrong about this, but I think it's relatively reasonable to think that the distribution among the neighborhood catchment zones is going to look kind of sort of like it does now, right? The city isn't changing. If refugees are, mo if, if newcomers are mostly coming from, although maybe the charter thing in influences this, I don't know, but if they're mostly coming from, say, the Giffen and Sa um, catchment areas, that's likely to continue in terms of trying to get our balanced enrollment. The, qu the other more complex question is, how does that impact the academic equity in each school, right? So that's, um, I think we're going to have to wait till Dr. Robin looks at the newcomers and sees if they really look really different and then maybe think through what are the projections. If the newcomers, if we want to build in an expectation of, of newcomers who look um, more like our, our traditional refugee population, then, then we need to build that into the model somehow because that's not built in at all, right now at all. Um, it's also, you know, it's, it's going to be really hard. That part's going to be really hard. So we'll we'll have to look at that and come back to you with something. Hello, Superintendent. Welcome. We hear you did a spectacular job today. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. It was an exciting opportunity. So thank you. You're welcome. I think all of our key points were talked about and gave kudos for all the things that have been done and then still 
here's what's left for us to do with our um, legislative priorities. So, great, great. but thank you. All right, uh, are, can we move now beyond the this newcomer thing that's setting, giving it to homework for Dr. Robin? Okay, so the other piece of data that's new since we last spoke to you is that we do have 100% accurate transportation data. So we now know this, nobody needs to understand these charts, just this is how they work. We have for each elementary school, if that elementary school went to Hackett, how many kids would be one, under one, one to 1.5 or 1.5, okay? We have that for every elementary school and for every um, uh, elementary school and every possible middle school that they could go to right now. So we are building the model based on the assumption that the kids who go to the neighborhood schools are gonna keep kind of looking like the neighborhood, the kids who are there now for their, uh, in terms of how far they live, where they live. Okay, that's the assumption we're building. Um, we also, and I'll explain why in a little bit, but we also got that data just for our students who have economic disadvantage um, so that we have that information separately. So we know both of those things. And I will, again, I'll get back to why I think that's important in a minute, but that's what we've got. That brings us to um, the next big item on the agenda, which is data. Um, as of today, that last thing that we just talked about just now, which is the way our newcomers behave, you know, if they behave differently academically, all the data we talked about last time is in place and it's on the spreadsheet that was emailed to you today. We have everything that we have talked about. So that's really good news. I want to stress that there is incredible amounts of uncertainty in these projections, right? We are making all kinds of assumptions that our students are going to keep looking like they do now right, that there's not going to be radical changes to what a typical um, Sheridan Prep student looks like or a typical Eagle Point student looks like. But that's an assumption we're making. I just want everyone to recognize that's the best we can do, right? And it's really important as we get to the next conversation about um, how many students will be in each elementary school, that we could be wrong, right? But we have to hope and believe that we're going to be wrong sort of proportionately, that we're not going to be really wrong in one school and really right in another school. And we're doing everything we can with examining the new entrants and the um, uh, retention numbers to try and do that. So I just want to stress that. And the reason I think that's important is I want to draw your attention to the big number, the big number over here, 1747. When you subtract out that 81.8% and then you add back in an average number of new entrants, we end up with 1,747 students in the district overall in middle school three years from now when this year's current third, fourth, and fifth graders are sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. So when the feeder pattern has fully gotten through, we would be at about 1,747. I have zero confidence that we will actually have 1747 students, right? It could be much more than that if we have lots of refugees. It could be much less than that if we don't get, if we get, you know, a mass exodus or another charter school opens, all kinds of things can happen. But our best projection is that we've got 1747 middle schoolers to deal with. The reason that's important is that if you divide that number by three, you get 582 students per school. 582, right? That's a very small school compared to what some of our middle schools have looked like the whole time I've been involved in the district. We've looked at 6, 625, right? Um, and then this year, of course, much, much more because we are a little bit wedged in there. But it means that our concern that we talked about last time about trying to keep every school under 630 or 660, we, our model doesn't suggest we have to worry about that at all, right? We are, every school should be well under 660 and certainly well under 630. And so then the question is, and this is one that I just, I don't have a good sense of operationally. I think this is an assumption that we've been building in all the way through, but I wanted to hear from the operational staff. I believe we agreed that the most important thing, besides keeping them under 660 or 630, is that they be similar in size, right? So it's not enough for them just to be under 630. They should be similar in size. And I just wanted to 
you know, just validate that that's my understanding because we can look at the projected range and try and narrow that. Um, and so is that, that's what we're doing, right? That's our, our fundamental agreement. Lori's nodding, so that makes me feel comfortable. I think it is um, because that's one of the main things that we've talked about. And then we can also balance out our resources that we have to leverage in some schools now. Um, it would also help us to balance out the resources. But when I look at that 582, I would support that simply because it gives us roughly 20 seats at each school that gives us a little flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that even though that's a little low, it's not unreasonably low. It's not like saying that, oh, you're going to have a school at 480 or 500 and everybody else is going to be, you know, higher than that. If they're if all three middle schools are hovering around the 480, I mean, the 580, 600 range, that gives us absorption of new people coming into the district, people moving from one area to another. We have some flexibility there, and then we don't have one school that is, you know, 200 kids more than another school. Can I just ask operationally, does it make the classes smaller? Like, does each teacher get have to have fewer kids? Is it like? Yeah, so what I would say is, is that, you know, 583, I'll round it up to 600 um, just for ease of, of the math. Um, so what will happen is we'll just assume that there's 200 students per grade level. You still need two teams of at each grade level and a, and a, a continuum of, of, of teachers at, at each for each of those teams. So while it, it, it would probably make class sizes at about 20 um, in the core areas, which is is uh, is optimal in my opinion um just given the the needs so you know you think about our middle school needs with going through puberty and the you know the transition from elementary to middle the social emotional mental health the behavioral needs and so um when you know when we look at our sixth grade cohorts right now those cohorts are smaller in size and they're um you know from a social emotional behavioral perspective much more successful because they have fewer kids in the classroom so that would you know when you think about 583 to 600 that's a perfect uh number of students 200 per grade level so i want to remind everybody about what i just said about there's a lot of uncertainty in this data right so that 580 even if imagine we could create scenarios that were perfectly anticipated to be um perfect in reality, they are not going to be perfect. How much they're going to be not perfect, we don't really have a sense of what our own error is there. But I do like what Lori and the superintendent said about the fact that it gives us some flexibility. Um, as a parent, I know it's really easy to say like, oh, smaller class sizes are awesome. I'd love to see that school go down to like 450 and then the class sizes would be really small. As a board member and a taxpayer, reality starts to hit because then you're talking about a really expensive model, right? And then you know, a huge amount of resources are being put on general education in that building. And so at a certain point, that becomes unsustainable um, just from a, you know, a tax based perspective. So I think the best we can do is say we're aiming for just schools that are comparable in size and then as a practical matter, if we're grossly wrong and there's many, many fewer students in the district than we think there are, again, some some board, some number of years down the road is going to be faced with that question of what to do about that because it will it could become unsustainable. On the other hand, if we're wrong in the wrong in the other direction, and in fact we're not at 580, we're at 620 or 630, at least we're in the realm of possibility like I you know we're on the upside we're we're safer on the downside I do you know there's there's some risk there that it, it's going to be we, we might not have enough students to support three field middle schools if our enrollment does not sustain we just don't know um this is the nature of our of living in Albany Lori you look like you wanted to say something yeah and, and I'm not a statistician um but I know the program um you know side of the the um middle schools and i'm just and i i think i know the answer but i'm just going to add ask it um 
beginning in the 22-23 school year, each, each middle school will have six self-contained classrooms. That's an increase from what we have right now. And okay. I'm wondering, because it's, it's equal across each of the three middle schools, does that, do we need to worry about um, factoring that into our equation or no? From a st statistician perspective. Uh, um, me, does, does that mean that the self-contained classroom, so this is a special ed population? Correct. Is going to be evenly distributed among the three middle schools? Correct. Yeah, each, each school will have six self-contained classrooms. So will that override elementary feed patterns? It sure will, but Cecily and I just had a meeting with um, special education today to look at um, projections for next year and program um, placements. And so right now what we're doing is, is we are, we know where the needs are for sixth grade, um, but as far as where we place that strand for sixth grade and then slowly moving them into their feeder middle school um, will be dependent on, on this work. So, so should we, to be the most accurate, should we subtract the self-contained students from the population as a whole? And because they're going to be equally among the middle schools, right? You guys are going to see to that. Um, so it will override the feeder pattern. So we can look now because I know that's on the um, in the data that we have how many self-contained students are in each elementary school drop them out and change the proportions that way. You see what I'm saying, Dr. Robin? Just for enrollment data, because their yeah, performance data are still in data, Yes. We, we would have to back them. We could also back them out of the academics, but that, I don't know how much work that is. It would could be a lot we go ahead, Could we go ahead and run them where they are? And I'm not trying to create unnecessary um, you know, I don't want to get into analysis paralysis, but I do think about if we go ahead and run them where they are and see how it falls out. And then if we run them without, if we run, if we do the runs without the self-contained programs, um, see the difference that it might make. It's 90 kids, right? It's six. Wait, it's 90 kids. Lori, it's it's six classes. How, so, how many students so are we talking it's, about it's per grade? Yeah. yeah, so it's difficult to say because so we have 812s, we have 613s, we have 151s, we have 1212s, um, meaning 12 students, 9 students, 15 students, 6 students. And so it's, you know, it's difficult to say it's a straight, you know, we can't multiply 6 times 15 to get that 90 because they're not all 15 ones. Um, I, I have the data. Um, the projections for sixth grade for next year, uh, if that would be just a helpful um, number to for projection purposes. Because the programs are going to follow, I mean, we're going to adjust the programming based on the needs of the kids at the school. Except yeah, I think so it doesn't really work that way, right? We take the in for for this scenario, we're going to move the kids to match the program that's offered, right? That's that's correct. But for example, and I'll just use Arbor Hill as an example. If we have an Arbor Hill um, fifteen one classroom, and we also have a fifteen one classroom at Myers, and Arbor Hill feeds into Myers, that fifteen one class would go to Myers Middle School because what we talked about today, Cecily, Michelle, uh, myself, and the special ed team is, it's really important for our self-contained kiddos to follow their elementary cohorts into the ele into the middle school if, if we can. We know that that's not always possible, um, but it, that's important for us. So depending how the scenarios work out and which ones kind of rise to the top, it, it may be an issue, it may not. Like in theory, the special education population could, in an equitable scenario that, or the group that we end up looking at, could split out fairly evenly among the three middle schools, or it could be an issue that they concentrate in one or another, right? And then that's where we'd have to make some adjustments because some of those kids would then be moved so that that population was split into thirds. Is that right? 
That is correct. And it's not terribly out of alignment across the three middle schools when you look at sixth grade specifically. Um, but there is, you know, a little bit of, you know, the, a difference just because of the, the ratios. So let me look more at the special ed population, how it's distributed in the in the elementary schools currently and how, you know, depending how the groupings play out, um, how imbalanced that could end up making things. And maybe I can pull out some um, some performance data on the special ed population to to get it some sense of how, how much that would impact um, mm -hmm. the, the academic scores of the middle schools. I suppose the most theoretically accurate thing to do would be to pull all the self-contained students out of the enrollment, pull all the self-contained students out of the um, academic data, right? So that, the, that that big giant colorful block at the top is only non-self-contained students. Um, and then distribute the self-contained students equitably among the middle, the middle schools. Because um, otherwise they're just impacting the data, right? Because like I'm just thinking about Montessori, which is, is the school I know best, has an unusually large percentage of self-contained students because it's only a too deep school for general ed. And it's got what, four? So Actually, they look very similar to other schools. So for example, Arbor Hill has five, Ash has five, Toast has okay. four. So what you're going to find when you go through is a it's not a singular strand that runs through each elementary building. So some may have, you know, three, eight, one, twos and two, fifteen mm -hmm. ones. And you'll find that there are buildings that have no self-contained classrooms at all. And so, you know, <clears throat> trying to have, have them follow their peers to middle school will be work um, if we're able to do it wherever possible. But I would agree that taking them out of the data is going to give you the cleanest picture. OK. So that's a big to do. We've got to subtract them from the enrollment and from the all the academic data, and then we have to rerun the scenarios um, with that properly accounted for. Okay. Hey, Anne. Yes. Just a question. Yes. Now that it's in a database and uh, it's set up to run on its own, right? Yes. Once you once you feed it everything and you say go. Three days later, you look at it and it it's done all its thing, and you say, okay, I'm, what's the top ten or top fifty? Right. Would it make sense to independently do it with the data as it is and to look at the special ed data to see how that population yes. distribution is biased? If it's not biased, great. You're so, already there. If it is biased, you know, would you just take this these top 10 scenarios and see how does that impact those top 10 scenarios to, to use it as a refinement tool? Yes and yes and no. Um, so yes, in theory, the challenge is just the tool. If I had if I had anticipated that, I could have built it in a um, data in a true database, you know, like in a Microsoft Access or a SQL or an Oracle or something. But because it's in Excel, Excel is very unhappy running against five hundred thousand rows of data with twenty, <laughs> you know, two hundred calculations per row. Excel just chokes. Right, so what I have to do first is call some rational number of scenarios and in, and I'm going to get to the rational number I currently have, which will have to be adjusted down to like 5000 or something, which are based on enrollment being nothing about academics, just about pure enrollment. And these changes that we've talked about tonight impact that, right? They impact which 5000 you're going to compare. So once you pick your 5000, I'm picking 5,000, doesn't have to be 5,000, could be six, could be four, whatever. Once you've picked the ones that looked enrollment balanced, then yes, what you've just described is not terribly hard. Copy, paste the spreadsheet, make a couple changes and you're okay. But you can't do that against 500,000 scenarios, um, at least not without the database, not without a much bigger computer than I've got. So um, I think we have to make some of these adjustments to enrollment in order to pick which scenarios we're going, which many thousands of scenarios we're going to then run through the process. But then, yes, we can do like the superintendent said, and you said, run it both ways and see, does it really matter? Like, does are, are there different ways of looking at this? I do think we will quickly get to a point where we can't mentally handle the complexity of looking at it multiple ways. Like, we'll just run out of net mental power. So we are going to want to focus in on what we think is the best way, but we can determine which is the best way by comparing two ways and going like, oh yeah, this doesn't feel right. So we, we can do that um, to a certain extent. I'm also cognizant of the time. 
we had said we would try and get back to you um, both clock time and calendar time. We had thought we would try and get back to you with scenarios next week. We've just added two relatively significant new points of analysis in that have to be factored in. So we just, you know, doing that and then doing it multiple ways becomes just a calendar time issue. Um, so can I ask, and not to complicate it, but on a third maybe way, just in thinking about the population groups, I mean, I, I think it does make sense to pull out the, the self-contained students. Does it make sense to consider, in, instead of getting to that 582 and 1700 number in that way, like does it make sense to just consider the kids who are enrolled already as, as one group and, and take like 80% of them and then consider the new kids as their own group, just because that could rise and fall in population so much. Like the other, the kids who are already enrolled seem somewhat stable. It's like, you know, you take 80%. I think right. that's what Dr. Robin is going to look at. When he looks at the newcomers that we've actually had, do they look like their elementary catchment student peers? Or do they look radically different, right? I think Lori's hypothesis is that they're going to look really different because they're mostly refugees, right? As opposed to, say, the kids in the New Scotland catchment area who are mostly not refugees. Um, so I think that's the next step for Dr. Robin is to look at that. And then if they're really different, pull them out. But I guess that's maybe that's about academics. I mean, just on population, that the population of the kids who are already enrolled in elementary is somewhat stable. It's like you take 81% of whatever the enrollment is, but the number of new kids, like it was 110, and then it was 80, and it was 60, and this year it'll be 500. And like that in population, just like the, the new kids, putting academics aside, like population-wise is, is a really a complicating piece, but the like already enrolled kids, you could at least have like a base you're somewhat confident in or something. I hear, I hear what you're saying and we can we can do the we can figure out if we're going to maintain our policy, which is that your home address dictates your middle school. If you were not an elementary student in our district. We need to make some assumption for that. Right. We need to know that there are going to be way more New Scotland, Eagle Point, Sheridan Prep and SA students than there are Ash and Montessori and Dual and Toast students. Because of the way we enroll our middle school students and just to get balanced enrollment, we have to make some assumption for them. Otherwise, we're assuming zero, which is clearly wrong. Right. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, or we could be building schools that are 500 each and just assuming we're going to split the newcomers, you know, 100 to each school. Like you could but just that would be a change in policy. And so I hear what you're saying, but but we would have to make a decision then that we're not going to use neighborhood at neighborhood address to decide which middle school you go to, which um, I, 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 I don't know. Um, could we make that decision? We sure could. And then we could just say every, you know, we're just going to go one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three with each newcomer. But or that would be. You, live, you go to the school closest to your house. I, I don't know. I, I hear what I, I, I'm just asking if the population's like just if in we calculating look, it. Like it yeah. seems like the, the, the enrolled elementary kids are just a stable number, I guess. I just think we need to have a we need to know we need to have a plan for those new kids. If you're going to say it's the one closest to their house, then we need to make Myers and Hackett way smaller. Wait, wait. We need to allow okay. room in the Myers and Hackett schools because they're going to have more kids closer, right? And oh. not going to be kids close to North Albany. So if that's the assumption we're going to make, we can build that into the model. But I don't really think that's what we want to do. We've always had this policy that neighborhood neighborhood dictates school unless you're in a magnet. So that that's the challenge with just, you know, we, we have to make some assumption. Um, and remember, 84 kids is one year, right? It's a lot of kids over the course mm -hmm. of three years. So I think I did that right. Now I'm second guessing myself. That is one year, right? Yeah, because that's just sixth grade. We only looked at sixth grade. Um, so it's one year, 100 kids in a single year, each year. Um, so it, it, may, it has huge impacts on, the, um, on making sure that we allow room in the school for new kids. Um, so, Ken. Just 
It's a little, um, I'm just thinking about the analysis and we're delving now into the, obviously the newcomers don't have fifth grade data. So they're not currently in the performance data or the, I can't compare to the, the stable population data you're talking about. Um, I'm, go ahead. I was just well, on the new and release, is this just sixth grade numbers or is this like the whole school? Like, do kids enter seventh grade in, in these? They do, numbers? and we thought about that factor um, to see if that's something we need to worry about. But then we looked at over time the overall middle school population. We don't see a huge increase. It's not tradition. It's not it doesn't happen every year that sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. Like we're just adding lots of new kids all the time. So it so if there are new seventh and eighth graders, they're being offset by departing seventh and eighth graders. In theory, the new feeder pattern could also change what we see in movement in seventh and eighth grade because it's whole different populations of kids within those middle schools. So the past might not predict the future very well in that regard. Um, for the newcomer analysis, we'll 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 try to learn more about them, but there is I would have to compare their academic indicators to to non-newcomers from the same schools in the sixth grade. So we'll be looking at sixth grade versus sixth grade numbers. I'll do that, but there's also just the fact of being a newcomer to a district and a newcomer to a school is a distinguishing factor from kids who are already established in the districts and in the schools. So they're kind of at a little bit of a disadvantage to begin with. So I just like, in terms of over interpreting, if the newcomers numbers are a little bit lower, it's it's hard to know exactly what that means or if there's a little bit of a ramping up period that they yeah, need. Yeah, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm wondering if it's even necessary for us to pull it out. I was more concerned about um, the influx of our newcomers to our district and how that would impact. But when you think from a, a think about it from a program perspective, all three of our middle schools and AIC will have that that program for our newcomers. So they'll get services regardless of where they go and it's just how we balance out the numbers as they enter in in the district so i'm wondering if you know as i'm listening to the conversation if it's even even necessary as long as we don't wildly unbalance our schools by accident right like you know we, if we know that they come in based on their neighborhood elementary catchment area we just need to anticipate that they're going to come in at that same distribution across the district, right? X percent from New Scotland catchment, X percent from spa catchment. Um, uh, OK, I mean, it is possible to pull data for sixth grade newcomers and see how they test academically, et cetera. But it's very narrow data. We only would only have this year because we wouldn't have prior year's data. And as Dr. Robin said, their transition or status is going to impact, could well, impact the performance. But why wouldn't we? I mean, I realize it's different kids, but why wouldn't, I mean, aren't there sixth grade newcomers each year? So you're say, saying looking at eighth graders who were newcomers in sixth grade, something and like seeing that? Seeing how they, what their test scores were in sixth grade, for instance. I mean, obviously, there's so many assumptions like kids from Afghanistan may perform differently than kids from Myanmar. Like, what what are they bringing academically as they arrive in the district could vary so tremendously, I'm sure. But look, looking at newcomers, sixth graders at any, any of the last few years would give us something that may be more, more similar to each other. That's an assumption in itself, but maybe. Yeah, pulling the data is not a problem. You're right. It's We have it for like the last three years. We, the 110, 80, 84, and 67, whatever it was. We can pull those kids and compare their data to their peers who were, uh, you know, continuing from fifth grade. I'm just wondering how we would apply that information and sort of interpretation and programmatically how it would impact things. Um, if, if it's worth doing, we'll do it, but just want to know that it's worth doing. My guess, my hypothesis is that it's going to balance out across the three. I mean, as you said, and that could be a con another control. We're starting to have a lot of controls on these. We're going to end up with like two scenarios, but I'm um, trying to even out to just be aware of looking at the way the newcomers and the way the special ed population distribute is something we could also build in.
Let's take that away and see where we go with Dr. Robin and me as we as we pursue this, because I think we, we, it does get to a point where there's a certain diminishing returns um, on the amount of work, and we do want to get to an answer at some point. Um, so let's see if if anything pops out when he looks at the data to see what the, the what what he thinks. Um, uh, but I think we're saying we are going to just continue to distribute newcomers percentage wise based on their neighborhood elementary catchment area. How that impacts the academics is is still open to a potential refinement of the study, but we're going to use neighborhood catchment for enrollment balancing. Um, OK, and I just want to go back and just reiterate the that number I think you gave was 583. So that 583 to 600 would be the optimal middle school size. Um, and so if, if that's something that we can strive to accomplish in this process, that would be wonderful. We're aiming for it. Let me let me get us to the next um, level on the agenda, because I think this next piece is really important for everyone to really conceptually grapple with. It's a conceptual um, thing that I had not really understood until we had more conversations and until I saw Dr. Robbins work. This comes back to the conversation that Dr. Wilson Turner and I had at the last meeting where she said, basically, I don't understand. We're just going to run the scenarios. We're going to come up with the best one and that's the one we're going to do, right? Um, and we talked through what what the what's true about that and what, what variations are going to need about that. But then when I started really thinking about what Dr. Robin said, I realized that for any possible alignment, and by alignment, I mean taking our elementary students, elementary schools, and creating three groups, right? We've got three groups of elementary schools. We could take group one and send group one to Hackett, Myers, or North Albany. We could take group two and send it to either of the middle schools that group one didn't already get. And then group three is going to go to the last middle school, right? But they're all that. Go back to your combinatorics from when you were probably in 10th grade. That's six possible ways to rearrange the groups, OK? Three times two times one. Six possible ways that we can arrange those groups. All six are going to have identical internal equity metrics. They're going to be identical because the groups are the same. No matter which middle school you put them at, the groups are the same. So no matter how we define equity, we are not going to be able to use equity to determine which of those scenarios we like the best, which of the six. Everybody's nodding, everybody's tracking with me. I'm calling a group of six scenarios a set. That's just the language I'm using, a set of six scenarios. And so no matter what, when we define equity, we may come up with, let's say, five sets that we think are worth our sufficiently equitable or equally equitable. That's going to be 30 scenarios, right? Six sets times six scenarios. I said five sets times six scenarios. I said six before, but let's call it five. 30 scenarios. We are by definition going to have to use some other way of determining which of those to choose. So far as a group, we've only talked about two things that I'm aware of. One was the insight that the feeder committee initially had originally, which is well, let's not make the district crazy by changing things if we don't have to, right? We would like to minimize the number of changes, right? Within a set, right? We would prefer, if the set's gonna be the same, one with a smaller number. The other issue that we've talked about is transportation, right? We would prefer to see something good happen with transportation, Defining something good is a little tricky, but in general, the insight that Dan had was it's bad to have to walk more than a mile but not be eligible for busing, right? Um, and then the other piece that, which is the reason I said this at the beginning why I asked for the economic data, is that we may, when push comes to shove, want to look at our, how families that have additional economic challenges, how they're impacted by transportation, right? I'm not saying for sure that's what we're going to do, but I know that our fundamental core value 
is equity. And equity doesn't mean everybody's the same, right? Equity means that we recognize that some people have additional challenges and other people have additional assets. Um, and by assets, I mean actual money, right? And so we could use that data when push came to shove. I'm not asking us to make that decision now, right? We'll be able to look at the actual scenarios and see how impactful that is. But I just wanted to make sure people understand conceptually we can't rely on the equity data to dif differentiate between scenarios within a set. We're going to have to look at number of changes in transportation. And this is where I'm wondering if anybody has any other brilliant ideas um, for us to think about that could help us differentiate besides distance to school and how that equates to transportation and the number of changes. Do we have anything else that we're working with? Yeah, we I guess this goes back to what I was, when I was trying to build it earlier and clearly didn't really have the tools that you have at all. So, and I, it, it was much rougher. I was trying to do it as, as little decrease to Hackett and Myers as possible. That like in choosing scenarios, I, I guess they'll be so equitable. Maybe it doesn't work now because you're talking about like hundredths of a point, but that's what, I guess before it was like, let's, there'll be students and teachers who remain. So for them, they're not experiencing it like a new sixth grader is like, this is my school. They're experiencing it as my school is changing. And so I was trying to like minimize the change to the school from the current base, I guess, because I thought of that as like standing for the change the incumbents, I guess, would experience. I don't know if it just doesn't make sense now because the numbers are just so close, it just doesn't matter, but for that. I think we also have to make sure that we keep in mind um, that academic component and the academic breakdown, um, because again, I have to keep going back to the resources that we have that we're going to be able to support our schools with. So, um, and as an educational institution, that's our. We, I'm, I'm is, talking about within a set, right? So by definition, all six scenarios within a set have identical academic identical. metrics. They're identical. Yep. We have like that. That's the. Then that means there's going to be that subjectivity piece, which is not as subjective, but it becomes part of that discussion that we have to look at. And I think I do think that we need to see it probably before we can really kind of wrap our arms around it, but I do think that we have to understand that there is going to be that component. I, I ask a question just about like the resources, like do we have a school where there's um, like washing machines or some sort of services where if we can make the grades equal, we would want to put more economically disadvantaged kids at that school just because we can't have something at all three schools, or is there any non-equality in, in the distribution of resources that we can't redistribute or anything like that? We would be able to redistribute, and that's one of the things that we want to keep in mind because we, we want to make sure that we can balance out those resources. And Dan, one of the metrics Great. we will, and I don't know if this would, meet, would address your concern, but we are going to be looking at the number of schools um, that would have to change where they feed to. So would the scenario where that number was the smallest be the preference, like given your incumbency concern? Well, I, I guess yeah, in choosing between the sets, yeah, I would always pick of the six, the one that had the fewest changes. But I guess on the other piece, I, I was more saying a third criteria would be like the you calculate whatever the current school is and then you take the new school and I would want as like figuring like just in how it's going to go down Myers and Hackett are giving up points to improve North Albany and so I was saying I wanted to take as few points as I had to you know and not more like, I know. think that's going to work all going to fly um kind of work itself out because our primary directive is that the schools be as comparable as possible so if Hackett, I think right now outperforms Myers a bit. So if they all end up at the middle, Hackett will go down more than Myers, right? Because they're all going to be roughly the same. 
and so I just don't think there's any way around that. No, 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 no. I don't mean. That. I guess it's like if if Myers is in at seven and Hackett's at eight and North Albany's at three, right? And you can end up with a scenario where they all end up at like between five and five point five. I would say, OK, Hackett should get 5.5 because it decreases the school itself. The least when we're calling everything equal. So like I'm talking about. I think I your, your instinct that it's not going to matter enough because they're all going to be sufficiently comparable to each other. Uh, I think uh, that that's the right instinct, I think. Okay. So, so and in, in terms of uh, transportation, uh, I mean, we talked about the number of changes. We talked about the. 1 to 1.5. You know, give, given that if, if we come to a situation where there's equally everything else being equal, they are all you know, identical in that set. Another thing to consider would be the extracurricular activities like athletics for one. Middle school, they're all going to have uh, CDTA passes, right? Now, yes, they may have a CDTA pass, but if they are doing an after school program or whatever, and they have to go back home and you have to take two or three buses to get home because there's no tripper bus taking them home. That might be something that we want to think about as a finer distinguishing between. How, how would that work? I'm just having a hard time understanding that because the academic where the athletics happen isn't going to change, right? Because the kids are still going to be for uh, soccer. They're all going to come. Right, right, right. No, but but the thing is, like to come to school and go to school, we may have tripper buses in the morning and in, and at three o'clock, right? But if they're doing an after school thing at five o'clock, there is no tripper bus. So now they would be relying on the CDTA regular buses. So they may have to take a bus from point A to point B to maybe point C instead of a direct route that they would have had in the morning or the when school lets out. I, I understand. How would we use that to balance? How would we use that as a metric to different? No, so if, if, if one choice gives them a better route so that they, more people can hopefully participate in those activities and not be turned away just because I don't need to have to take three buses to go to the other side of town. They're all things being equal. Huh. What okay. I'm saying? I do. I just don't know how we would do it. I can't. I can't visualize how we would gather. You'd have to you, kind of. I don't. Okay. I don't think add how we do. to the to the records you have where it already has the distances. You could just add how many connections it would take. Like, like right. Would you need that CDTA. Right. Or do, does the district have like non trip? Bus. Yeah, and there's so many variables in that that I think it would be hard to use it as a data point to make a decision on um, where we would place our elementary schools into the middle schools. Um, and you know, and I just think about you know our middle schools now. All three of our middle schools have extended day programs, and we provide transportation. Um, and you know, we have shuttle buses if they're practicing for athletics over at. Um, Albany High School or at another uh, middle school. Um, so I, I mean, I haven't heard right, that Lori, but barrier. Those, but it's, it's a shuttle that takes them to that whatever the practice place. Like for example, if it's the high school, the bus will take you from Hackett or Myers to the high school and bring you back, but not right. back to your house. And I'm talking about that next leg where once you're at the high school, you still have to get back home at six o'clock. And if you're going to take three buses or two buses, but I don't I don't think we can put that in the feeder alignment piece because again, that's extra and I don't and, and by extra, I mean that's part of the after school activities. Well, plus if you're coming from Albany High, you're going home regardless of which middle school you went to in, th in the middle. Why is it even relevant which middle school you went to in the middle? And right? how do you right, but also how do you I, account I which kids are going to choose what? Yeah. I'm talking if all things being equal, you come to a point where now you know, you've looked at the academics, you looked at the resources, and you looked at the you, you come to the minimum uh, changes, and now you got to still got to make a choice. That could be another finer point to think about, because then that in, in one scenario, one, more kids have opportunities. I think one of the ways that um, that would be possible is just to see how many of the elementary school students are in after school acti activities and attempt to equally balance those students to the middle schools. Um, and I don't want to like, move away from this topic, but I do have uh, my own thought um, 
because Anne, you were asking about additional pieces that we might consider. So, I, Dr. Tratur, if if it's okay. Um, oh, yeah, sure, sure. I was just okay. throwing out another thing to add to the list, you know, so that we can have a growing list of things you know, to consider when we come to that point where, okay, what do we do now? Okay. What's that? Uh, so um, I also, one of the things that we had at our last board meeting, I'm sorry, there's a baby screaming in the background. I don't know if you guys can hear it or not, but. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so we discussed uh, English language learners and there is a chart of English language learners per elementary school. And I don't know if any of the data that we already have right now has that incorporated into it. But um, is that something also we, we, we might also want to consider in terms of evenly spreading the English language learners throughout the middle schools? I know or is it just all that they're going to go to like Albany I think it's embedded in the risk. I think it's embedded in the risk factor, right? It's part of the risk score, yes. Um, we did, that data is easily available and it's something we can check once we narrow in on some scenarios easily. Uh, the dual program is going to feed to a particular school. So when you say balance, do you mean like considering the dual program is in one place that then the well, other two would have to do you, and the AIC program. program. Are you talking about AIC? I'm talking about both of those programs that you know have the um, the L's in them, I, and I know there are L's in other schools as well. Um, I the the chart um, last yeah, board. You're thinking yeah. about like if you took each elementary school, added up how many L's there are, and then looked at that within the scenarios as another factor to see if the L's are evenly distributed among the scenarios. Exactly. That that's not particularly hard to do if it's easy but, enough to get it, but I don't no. know how predictive it is. We're saying independent of the dual program. But if you have them, if you have so if you're so think about the AIC program, those students track back to their home school. So there's ELLs in every elementary, even the ones right. that are. Right, but, but, but if I'm not mistaken, those if you're in your home school, you're in your home school. So the so uh, how I I guess I'm I'm confused with how are we then saying that we're going to have a feeder alignment, but yet if you're an ELL student, we're going to ensure that you're going. Right. Well, we well, might find scenarios. That's one scenario. of these six scenarios is actually better in regards to that so we find right, that. not on an individual student basis but on a scenario wide basis just like we're going to try and equalize the number of high risk students would we want to right. equalize the number of l's i think is is what you're saying right hasan um yeah. and the, so the question is you know it probably wouldn't be terribly hard to do that. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if it's something that we what want. I don't know, and maybe Lori or Cecily knows, is does the number of L's in an elementary school stay consistent in general? No, it varies a lot. So it's just not going to be predictive. No matter what we did and built it into the model, it might change because it just it varies a lot. Is that is that? And to, what and to Mrs. Adams' point, now that we have AIC, it's going to vary even greater because, you know, families have a choice to make. They can choose to go to the AIC or they can choose to go to their neighborhood school, which is significantly impacted what the L enrollment has looked like at the elementary level. I but guess I do think we want, so. Go ahead, Superintendent. So what I'm thinking is, much like when we talked about the histogram. Once we look at the sets that we're talking about, we can easily do an overlay of how many at risk students by histogram are we looking at? How many e how many ELL students by histogram are we looking at? But not as a determining factor in the data of determining the sets, but we can easily do that overlay to see within the set. How does it break out? And I, I think that may be more along the lines just so that we can see um where that population might fall so i'm on, my understanding is that our goal would be and and this is an operational thing for um for Lori and cecily um we would want 
to only choose sets where the number of high risk students anticipated at each middle school is roughly the same, right? That we would want sets where there was balance among the high risk students, right? And the only way we're doing that calculation is by looking at the risk factors from the elementary schools. We are just we are assuming that the elementary school high risk students predict high risk students in the middle school, right? That's the assumption we're making. So Hassan is saying, ought we to do that exactly that exact same thing for else? And what I think I'm hearing is it's not school. necessarily a good idea because the risk factor stays roughly the same year to year, but the L's is all over the place and hard to predict Changes. because of what I see. Is that is that right? So year to year, the number of L's in a school will change. Much more dramatically than the number of high risk students. Yes, I would agree with that. Yeah. Could you could you I remind that, me one I more do, time? I do believe that's a fair statement. The Very risk uh, factor um, includes economically disadvantaged students, correct? Includes a, yes. it's factored into that. Yes. Yes. Because, OK, because I would say that that probably that number stays more consistent. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, this is a question than uh, uh, the, the L. Uh, and, and so maybe that's something that we can actually look more deeply in. Yeah, that I am planning to keep the number of high risk and we did quintiles based on our last conversation rather than compressing we step kept it at five and i'm only for right now my i haven't actually done this work but in my mind right when i project how the work is going to be done just the highest risk quintile um, would be the number would be something we would look to keep even then as the superintendent says when we look at the final thing, we'll look at the histograms, right? But they'll all have roughly the same number of high risk. We may then see variations among the higher risk. I'm calling them high, higher, moderate, lower, and low risk to give them names because I can't remember whether one is high or low, so I had to use names. Um, so we may find that after we do that, that we really do need to deal with the higher risk people too, right? We may have so many scenarios. We're like, well, we've already correlated the high risk let's also correlate the higher risk right we may be able to do that i think that's going to come down to how many scenarios actually we can we have right? like once we start winnowing um that may be an additional factor okay. the, risk, the risk number and dr robin has pointed this out too is a number we don't the district created um there's sort of questions about what does it tell us? For instance, just looking at the dual, which is the piece I, I know, the school that I know the best, I think the risk comes out somewhere in the middle, but right now the test scores are looking very high and the behavior, things are looking really good. I don't know if it becomes, behavior is high or low, but the behavior data is good. So it's like these kids are moderate risk, but doing well academically and not having behavior problems, does it matter that they're moderate risk? Or is it like, is the risk factor, is, is, the, is that risk number somehow not capturing what's going on for these kids? So I guess I, that's why it should only be one small <laughs> number of many. And economic disadvantage certainly is important and, and should be balanced in my mind. It's it's interesting when the risk number doesn't doesn't align, it doesn't correlate the way we would, we would expect it to with some of those other factors like behavior and academics. So one thing we do not have in the model that we could do, just like Hassan has said for the L's, we don't have pure economic disadvantage in the model right we do only have the risk factor um so that is something that would be not hard to add right because we know what percentage each elementary school is um in terms of econ non-econ and l non l the econ as, as somebody was saying marina i think the econ non-econ it does seem to be more consistent across time, so we could put that in um, and that I don't think would even be hard because that data is readily available. Um, and so we could build that in. Um, that, seems in the so risk, cool. it's not one. that seems so core to our mission as a group, like if this is about equity, then I feel like looking at balancing that also seems incredibly important or at least at least having it front and center so we can easily see what's going on and how it's balancing or not balancing. I would also concur with that. OK, that, that, that one's I think really Dr. Robin, you don't have any concerns about putting that in, do you? No, there's going to be some overlap with some some things that are already in there, but that's that's already the case. I mean, I 
the virtue of the risk score, and you're right, Dorian, it's not. There, there probably are, especially a, a population like the duels, there might be some problems with it. But it is an aggregation of a lot of the important factors that we're talking about. And at some point, pulling all that aggregation apart, if we add too many individual components to the model, um, it's going to become unwieldy and start introdu and introduce more error and problems than it is going to offer clarity. Um, yes, and it's easy to do. If that's what people, that's the direction people want to go, we'll do it. I'm not sure how much it's going to add to the predictive quality of the model. I don't think it's going to change much, but that's something we can check at least. So at least we know we've we've crossed that one off and, and considered it. Yeah, I, I'm hoping that we'll be able to come up with sets of scenarios that are good on all of the metrics, right? We'll be able to say right. these these different sets, say six sets, are all are, are, are reasonably equitable on every single metric um, that we have defined. Um, and I think having econ, non-econ as one of those metrics, even though it overlaps, I do think that would be illustrative. Um, so. Can, can I ask, is there, um, in addition to the, the averaging of it, are we able to like look for medians too? I think we, we talked about it a little that just, you know, if we had a school, if one of the middle schools was, you know, all the component schools were a five and one of the middle schools where it was a component school was a 10 and then three ones, it might average the same, but it's, it, you know, the schools. Yeah, are, we're not going to look at averages. We're going to, for, for things like L, uh, for, sorry, for things like econ, non-econ, we're just going to count the kids. We're not going to look at like the average number. We're going to say in this projection of the 600 kids that are in this middle school, 400 are projected to be economically disadvantaged. And in this other scenario, it's 300. And so we'll be able to compare across. And, you know, right now our district is roughly two thirds, one third, right? So we would expect each middle school to be roughly two thirds, one third. Um, so that's that's the way we're doing not it's not going to be average um it for for something that's an off on switch like eco, economic develop disadvantage the average works out to about the same right but for things like test scores the average is a little different right because that truly is an average so um, but for things where we can count kids we're counting kids we've also been talking about equity uh, talking about transportation as if it's not part of the equity balance. We've, equity means, as we've been discussing it, the academics. But I would argue that transportation is part of the equity, that, you know, it affects attendance, it affects financial costs for families, it affects how far kids have to go to get to school. But to say, like, we're going to do equity and then we'll look at transportation, which is a separate factor, I think we should talk about that as being equity also. Or, yeah, or I, the, yeah, the terminology I was trying to use was internal equity. I, that's what I put in the agenda because the key factor is, does it, are they all the same within a set? Exactly. Right? Transportation it, is going to be yeah. different, right? Within a set is internal to the school building. Yeah. And then you can move the groups around and that's why transportation is different because it changes when you move the group. Exactly, right. You're going to move the group all together. Um, right. But I do think we've decided, and, and this I think is the way the committee has been working, that in that we wouldn't allow transportation equity concerns to override the internal equity concerns, the test scores, the number of uh, econ economically disadvantaged students in the building. Now we may, when push comes to shove and we see 36 scenarios, we may say, well, the transportation is so inequitable in this one that we're uh, going to choose one of the lower ones in terms of, you know, they're all acceptable equity wise, but we are going to choose that one. Like I think we could make that, but we're not going to make it an initial um, evaluation um, is, is my understanding that we're focused initially on what's happening within the group. Um, OK. Uh, I would like to just move on a little bit to the next item on my personal agenda because I wrote the agenda so that therefore I want to control it. Um, but feel free to tell me we need to go back. 
Um, I have to unsay what I said here. Uh, I, I had this little section called initial wi initial winnowing. The database format is set up. I'm going to have to modify it as Dr. Robin goes through and implements these new things that we've talked about tonight. So I'll have to redo some of what I did. So these numbers you should not assume will be the same next time I run this because we just decided that we're going to change some things about the way the enrollment is. But I ran just enrollment. I couldn't get to any academic work because I didn't have enough time from when I got the last bit of the data. But of the many, 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 many scenarios, over 500,000 scenarios, if I looked at just scenarios which had sets really that had a range of enrollment of less than 50, right? So the worst possible scenario would be 558 to 608 with the one in the middle being 582. Right, that's the least good enrollment balance I would accept. Everything else was closer than that. That brought us down to basically 4,000 scenarios, which is 664 sets. Those numbers are going to change a little bit next time because we just decided we're going to handle our SPED students differently and we're going to do all these different things. So those will change a little bit, but that gives you a sense of from the 500,000, you can get very quickly down to about 5,000-ish by just looking at how the balancing is going to happen. And then the next step is which we just I'm going to shift into the agenda here is to take the equity metrics that we've been talking about all night and figure out which scenarios to consider moving forward, which sets of scenarios really. And then looking at all these metrics that we've been talking about, are there any that are just problematic, right? Like I can imagine a situation in which all the metrics line up perfectly, but there's this one metric that just seems weird. Like you get different different scenarios get included if you include that. And the one that comes to mind is grades, right? Because we know that there's some subjectivity in the way grades are aligned. So that's just my hypothesis is that when push comes to shove, we're going to look at this and we're going to say, oh, look, we can align economics. We can align NWEA. We can align state test scores. We can align all this stuff. But as soon as we put in grades, different things start to happen in terms of which scenarios get pulled. I might be wrong. I'm going to show all my work so you guys will be able to make that um, decision on your own. So you'll be able to see what the ramifications are of those kinds of decision um, decisions. But that's what comes next is Dr. Robin and I will work on the things that we have talked about tonight, which is essentially the SPED students, how we're going to handle our self-contained students. Um, add, thinking about the newcomers and whether they're radically different than is predicted by their elementary school. Adding in the economic, non-economic flag so that we can do that on a per school basis. And then um, we should be able to get back to you. I don't know exactly when because it'll depend on how long that stuff takes um, and be ready to, to move forward again because I feel like we're getting close. Like if it just feels like we're getting closer and closer to something that we all can stand behind. There are two more dual factors that are big changes that will affect duals numbers that it made. I hate to introduce any more complexity and it feels like duals already gotten more than its fair share of sort of time trying to sort it all out. One is there's a change from uh, first come first serve the, the parent camp out to a lottery that I believe happened between the current third grade and fourth grade class that is a has created a noticeable difference anecdotally. It and happened I'm sure way I'm before that. It, 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 yeah, because my daughter was the first one in the lottery year. And she's a 10th grader this year. No, no but only for dual. Dual became lo a lottery school. After my kid, I camped out. And then later on, there are classes that are pure lottery. So the percentage of like college educated parents, which is something that parents often know about each other, but obviously we're not using in these numbers, is like triple for current fifth grade class versus a current third grade class. So there's there's you that factor out? that changed at some point. What's that? You camped out? For my older kid. Hmm. But my younger kid, there was sibling preference, which is also, I was the first year that there was sibling preference. I was prepared to camp out a second time. But anyway, so there's, <laughs> there's, a, there's been a change somewhere in there in terms of um, and the, the ability to camp out is a privileged thing. It'll, it's not 100%, but it, it's, it, you're easier. If it, it's easier to camp out if you have privilege. And then, and then the relocation of the school, because it's been so small, and many years only one or two kids got in, 
neighborhood preference is all what it was about. So all those kids show up on the map right now, the fifth graders is being very strongly clustered right around Delaware Community School, which is going to be a huge change because we moved the school across the city and we've doubled it. So where those kids are geographically, that transportation piece is also going to be completely thrown out of whack in the years ahead. What do we do about that? And do we try to predict, do we try to use that? No, we know that change is coming. What do we do with it? I have no idea. Excellent point. <laughs> so I just, I'll just throw that out there and happy to have more conversations. Or, we, or maybe we just say, we can't. <laughs> we just can't. Right now, right now, what we've done is double the dual in terms of its enrollment, but assumed for purposes of the projection that the new dual kids are gonna look just like the old dual kids. In terms of transportation, in terms of um, everything, we've just assumed that they're gonna look just like the old dual kids. Right. We know that's a false assumption. We just don't know what would be a better assumption because we don't have the data, they're, it's new. And you could say, well, there's going to be new neighborhood preference. So now we should assume that a percentage of kids are going to come from the new neighborhood, except we're also doubling it, which in theory allows more kids from all over the city to enter the program. Right. So it might end up looking more like uh, Montessori or like Ash. That would be my guess. It's going to be more scattered in general. But there, there, I would expect a cluster from around the school that we haven't had historically because those families will have preference now. All right. That's an insurmountable problem, Dorian. I don't like insurmountable problems. Hello, Kitty. <laughs> uh, anybody have any ideas for how we address the challenge that Dorian has put in front of us? I was actually wondering about the uh, the retention rates, specifically with dual, and whether the decision to move it had anything to do with the lower um, the lowering of those numbers. But they didn't, and they, they are bigger, they're higher now than they were before. The decision to move, if you recall, was really based on ex being able to expand the program and being able to accommodate more students. And I don't, we're not and actually, so that we, was, we don't, we don't have any retention within dual information here. There may, that information may exist, like, I'm sure it does exist. You could look at dual and say, you it, but, but that's not what this is. This is just, no. School students going to hack it. I see. Um, this is fifth to sixth grade retention. That's it. That's it. You know, we could look, we could figure out what the year, we can argue about exactly when it happened. We could look at the, the younger students, but then we've got an apples and oranges. You know, we could say, well, the third, the current third graders are more representative of the future of dual than the current and the recent fifth and sixth, you know, the recent fifth grade classes. But we can't compare a group of third graders to all the other fifth graders like that wouldn't that's not good data so so i can dig that you answer to that question you up. can't predispose what's going to happen in the lottery either. you can't predispose what's going to happen in the lottery with regard to students going there exactly i mean you can see the shift in terms of um race and college educated families and those types of things in the classes you can you can look at the fifth grade class and you can look at the third grade class and say yeah some, it, there's a change which is what we wanted. That's why we went to a lottery. It's more fair. We didn't want a whole lot of white college educated families having access to a program in a way that other people couldn't have access. Um, but but it, it's changing in the years ahead in a, in a good way. But the it will affect the data. Cecily, what were you going to say? I, I'm going to be quiet. I don't I um. I, I was the one who made the change. That they didn't sleep outside, so I can go back through reports and figure out exactly when that was. Um, but I, I, I guess I didn't. I can't think of why that would be dramatically different because similar families still apply to the dual language program over other programs. Um, and as to the retention piece of it, um, I would agree. Like that, we did. You could go and call. But we know that as we move up, we've moved up over the years in the dual language program, the intermediate grades tend to be smaller because you do lose students and you cannot add students who are non-native speakers beyond a certain grade level, beyond first grade. Mm -hmm. So we know that there is some attrition that occurs there. So yet that yes, that's e more easily found. But I, I never, I mean, I feel like the same parents call and ask the question about dual, right? That have that were the same parents that were sleeping outside for dual. Um, so I guess it would be interesting to to see if there is truly a difference um, in the in the population of parents, or the type of parent that is you know signing up for dual language program. Right. I mean, the other thing you'd have to do is correlate against if and how. And this is something I have never looked at: is 
is the district just shifting, right? It's part of your perception about dual change changing just that the district is percept is changing. I mean, we know nationally that public education is is becoming different, right? That the students in public ed are coming, but I just haven't really put the mental energy to think about over a 10 year or 15 year time frame. It's the day exists, I just haven't internalized it. Whether the district, I know that on race, it has not changed dramatically. It's district has been 20% white, give or take for a long time. Um, but in terms of socioeconomic class, I personally have not internalized that data to speak to whether that's a change that you're thinking is a dual change, but is really a district overall change. I really don't know. Um, I think where we are. Oh, go ahead. Will it not be reflected in the economically disadvantaged percentages? Oh yeah, I just don't know them. Do you off the, like it's we're at sixty six at least we will be sixty five, sixty six percent. And we're just not seeing a change, right? Superintendent, it's similar over course of time. Yeah, yeah, so there's not a big change. Okay, so I don't know. I don't know why I do will feel so different. That's really interesting. I mean, we know Montessori has gone through that same thing and we know exactly why, right? Because of the relocation of the building. And you can see absolutely huge change in the demographics from um, you know when the current let's say a student who's currently a senior in college versus a student who's currently a fifth grader you can just see it in the um, in the class composites as you walk down the hall it's it's really really noticeable and impactful um, and again not in a good way right dual is moving in the right direction and Montessori is um, you know although the last several years I, I just pulled this recently the last several years Monastery has been moving back closer to the district norm. Um, but anyway, we're a little off topic. Anybody have anything else on this topic? Otherwise, I think Ken and I have a little homework to do. And we will be back to you when we have a clear sense of when that could happen. Um, I mean, we would really like to get scenarios, recommended scenarios by next week, but I just don't know what's going to be plausible um, given this. Do meeting. we have a date for next week's meeting? Yeah. Let's see, I'm going to stop presenting so I can open my calendar. Just while you're looking for that, um, and I'm wondering if Ken needs any projection data for special ed for middle school for next year. I would think yes. What um, okay. I need to understand like how projection data is derived if that's possible. So someone I yep. can talk to or write to about that. OK, yep, we can talk tomorrow. Yeah, because from my perspective, he'll need to understand it better. But ultimately, what I need to know is how many self-contained students to put in each middle school when we rebuild the enrollment. Um, assuming we do it that way, subtract them out of the neighborhood schools and rebuild them in at the middle school level. That's what I'd need to know. And we have that information. We can share that. Awesome. Uh, so do we want for simplicity to say same bat time, same bat channel? February 2nd, that's Wednesday. Yep. And 6.30. OK. Then we will we will go ahead and uh, we'll send that invite out for everyone. Um, any last closing thoughts? I think we have enough homework. Bill, Can we do this something? meeting uh, in person? Bill? Can we make I'm a meeting sorry, in Bill? person? Can the meeting be in person? Uh, we can look at the meeting being in person. Uh, is that the will of the group? We can we can also do the blended format that we've done before where there's a group in person and a group that's uh, that's virtual so we can do a hybrid. I personally prefer the um, uh, remote uh, meeting. However, I understand if there wants to, you know, people want to have an in person. I just wouldn't want there to be two people in person or three people in person. I would be a remote user as well. as well. I'm sorry, Dorian, say that again. I don't know why I'm getting feedback. Um, I would also be one of the remote people. Next week. Well, we'll send out the link and then for those who would like to come in person, if you just want, would let me know 
I'm happy to be there in person and I'm happy to be there with if it's two people, three people, I'm fine. We can do it. I think I have to be virtual too because I'd have childcare stuff um, if I were not uh, virtual. Okay. For something like this, the virtual aspect of it is nice because you can put display different things on two different screens and look at things, whereas on my little surface, I can barely see one thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bill, if you would like to come and meet in person, I will be there with you if that's what you would like to do. And I'm perfectly fine with that because I'll be there. We're going to be here, but I'm fine. And I live like five minutes from HG. So <laughs> whatever, it's totally up to you. You don't have to decide tonight. You can just let me know. Okay? I just prefer being around a bunch of people, but if it's not going to be, if it's not going to be a bunch of people, don't worry about it. What am I chopped liver? A bunch. You're, you're one. <laughs> you're a chopped liver. I am a. OK, well, thank you all so very much. We'll get the links out to you. Have a great night. OK, bye bye. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good night. Good night.